This is Randy Sullivan, the host of Bourbon Real Talk. I grew up in a small town and went to a small church where everyone looked and thought like me. Over the years, I've gotten to know and love people from all different walks of life. This has made my world bigger and richer. The secret ingredient in forming those relationships was getting to know people's real stories. That helped me to identify with them, have compassion on them, and eventually develop a real connection with them. We live in a disconnected world today, and I want to do everything in my power to build connections between individuals who may not have attempted friendship otherwise. I've observed this happening in the bourbon community on its own because whiskey naturally brings people together. Bourbon Real Talk hopes to combine the world's new passion for bourbon into an opportunity to bring people together. We will share some whiskey knowledge, some good drams, and some real talk. So sit back, pour a drink, and open your hearts and minds. You might just find yourself feeling more connected to the people in the world around you, all fueled by bourbon. Hello, everybody out there in Bourbon Real Talk land. Randy Sullivan here. Super excited because we have a special surprise guest, yes. Spencer Whelan from the Texas Whiskey Trail, yep. among other things, which we're <laughs> going to get into. He happened to be in Dallas yes. doing some business yeah. and uh, working on the whiskey world. Working on for, the whiskey trail. For all of us whiskey nerds out there so that we can have all the good things, <laughs> right? right? And since he was up here and, you know, I don't even know why he graced me with his presence, but he reached out to me and boom, here we are. We had lunch and now we're recording a podcast. That's the, that's the beauty of the internet, right? It's, <laughs> that's right. Just connect on, the, connect on the phone and all of a sudden you're doing a podcast. That's, that's right. right. That's right. I did, I did send him a friend request the other day. Yes. So that probably helped. That, that helped. That probably yeah. helped. And I just joined your group as well. So. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So we are going to drink some Texas whiskey today because if you didn't pick up on that. It's kind of what we do. It's kind of what Spencer does, right? Yeah. And if it, you notice, I'm repping my uh, Texas whiskey trail t-shirt. Yeah. Pretty excited about that. And um, a little side note, not a Texas whiskey, but Texas company, repping a little of the Belfour Spirits. Nice. Uh, the podcast for that's going to drop today. So check that out if you get a chance. So uh, I'm going to be drinking out of a Lone Elm glass. Yes. And uh, we'll be drinking out of our very own certified Texas whiskey, Taste the Truth glasses. Taste the Truth. Because so. that's a nice, deep uh, laser cut. Yeah. So you got to be careful with some of these Texas whiskeys because they, they'll, they'll get some they'll, oil they'll eat in there. They'll, they'll eat you in there. <laughs> all right. So uh, gonna, you want to start off yeah, with Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So is this the, the barrel proof or single barrel? Yeah, is this, this a, is single barrel select. And I, I picked this one. I have three of them. This was a pick that I participated okay. in. This is, this is bottle two. This one, I get a lot of uh, fig, um, a lot of... Um, raisin type yeah, flavor, definitely raisin, chocolate covered raisin, mm -hmm. tons of cinnamon. But one of the things that I tasted in this was, I think they sell them at Costco. They're like chocolate covered uh, acai berries. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, this has that chocolate covered acai berry. But this one also had, and you don't get it as much on the nose, but on the palate, there's a little bit of that machine oil leather component mm -hmm. to it because I think this one might have gotten a little bit more oxygen while it was in the barrel. Yeah. And so it's got a little bit of that dusty funk to it there, on the palate. Yeah. There's a little bit of dust in there for sure. Yeah. I, I'm getting a little, uh, spearmint. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Sure. I mean, for sure. That's, that seems to be pretty consistent with a lot of Lone Elm with their, their, uh, red winter wheat from yeah. the Trinity Valley there. But like, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. There, it, it, there's a viscosity to it that I think it's like you could smell the viscosity. <laughs> right, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and, and that's that's a little weird. This is super geeky whiskey stuff, folks. But like, I mean, it's just kind of the way it is, right? Yeah, sure. It, and and some of these like notes don't sound good, right? You're like, oh, motor sure. oil, right? Yeah, you know, but it's uh, when when you get into whiskeys, especially Texas whiskeys, because I think that like from an aroma perspective, there's a lot there that. Is surprising. Sure. Right. And a lot, I think, you know, when a lot of people say, Hey, I don't like Texas whiskeys, it's because they don't know where they don't know what they're smelling. Sure. Or they don't know what they're tasting. Sure. Right. 
Um, it, you know, if, if somebody grew up, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, if somebody grew up on bourbons and you know, really good sweet bourbons, and then they're all of a sudden are trying like a Laphroaig, they're going it's to be, be like, shocking. they're going to be like, oh, this is horrible. This is a bad whiskey. But if you grew up with those kind of peaty aroma smells, and then you can appreciate all the layers within it. I think that's kind of where we are with Texas whiskey right now is that there's new compounds that people are associating with whiskey. Mm -hmm. And, and Lone Elm is a great example of it because it's, it's just, there's something there that is completely unique and doesn't, you know, when people hear wheat in whiskey, they think weeded bourbons. Mm -hmm. And this is not a weeded bourbon. No, this, this is, is a wheat, wheat whiskey. whiskey. 95%. You know, and, and it is, the wheat is the star and, but you wouldn't know it right, right. off the bat. You're right. like, what is, it's a little bit confusing, which in Texas, you know, for those folks who don't know, anything beyond three, three years, years is, is like, kind of a lot. wow. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden you're talking about really tannic flavors and, and, and sometimes it can totally go wrong, mm -hmm. and, but this does not. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, um, a little bit of a testament to something I've talking about in interviews that I've had with other folks. It's like, there's a lot of innovation going on in Texas mm -hmm. that you, people are figuring it out. Right. Um, as, as Jared Hempstead likes to say, it took about 10 years for us to figure out the kind of whiskey that Texas wants to make. Sure. Right. And I think that like, I, you know, keep referring to him saying that, but I think that's the best way to say it is like, yeah, the distillers are learning what this area wants to make sure. rather than what they want to make. So right. let's talk, let's talk about, there may be some people who've been living under a rock that don't know yeah. who you are. So, sure. so you are the CEO. So I'm the executive director of the Texas Whiskey Association and then CEO of the Texas Whiskey Trail. And the, the, the association is kind of the parent of the trail. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit before, but like uh, initially we wanted the trail to be a, a program of the association. Um, Laws and there are legal reasons are why you can't, but yeah. but to put it shortly, we, we created a subsidiary of the association that is a for profit entity called the Texas Whiskey Trail, so that we can sell memberships and invite people out to do events and pay taxes on all of that before anything enters up to the association. But at the end of the day, we're all trying to help grow the industry through the association, and the trail is kind of the consumer facing side of that. This is Randy Sullivan with RSHST Capital LLC and the host of Bourbon Real Talk. Producing a podcast is time-consuming and expensive, and Bourbon Real Talk wants to maintain its integrity by not promoting products or services that it doesn't believe in. For this reason, I have opted to have my funding company sponsor this program. RSHST Capital is the first-of-its-kind funding company that provides pay at close funding to home sellers out of their equity. If you have a home to sell, need money for renovations or repairs to maximize your profit, money to stop pending foreclosure or to keep your mortgage current, or cash for really anything, then look into RSHST Capital. This program is simple. We verify that you have equity, approve you for a funding amount, you have access to that cash at practically a moment's notice for only a nominal fee. This program is raising sellers cash after closing by tens of thousands of dollars, stopping foreclosures, and changing people's financial future. You pick your real estate agent, your contractor, and have access to actual cash or contracting expenses with zero upfront cost. This is a nationwide program. So if you have any curiosity about how it works, please look us up at rshstcapital.com, Facebook, or just give us a call at 214-385-9101. And what we are trying to do is not to create a new club. We are trying to create a, a community of communities mm -hmm. because, you know, we were talking about this before as well, but like the association and our certified Texas whiskey mark is intended to kind of create what the category of Texas whiskey should be. Right. right. Um, and so I, I kind of liken it to the NFL, right? Mm -hmm. The NFL is, the association that everybody agrees to how we're going to play American football and the Cowboys are not always going to like the Eagles, but at least they agree on the ground rules. Sure. And so that's what we're kind of trying to do. And then the trail allows all of these communities to come together under the common cause of Texas whiskey mm -hmm. and go and visit these different regions and experience different regions because that's where, 
that's where I think the most unique thing about Texas whiskey is right now mm -hmm. is every distillery is completely unique experience. Sure. You, you've been to many of them. Sure. And yeah. I, I, unlike um, some more established places, like if you go to Scotland, you go to Kentucky, you're going to have a similar experience from one distillery to the next because they've kind of merged their experiences over time. Yeah. Over, you know, decades and hundreds of years in some cases. Um, we don't, everybody here is an entrepreneur. Everybody here has a slightly different tasting room, has a slightly different experience. You know, you have a very urban experience. If you go down to Deep Ellum mm -hmm. um, or still Austin, um, you can have an amazing experience in a business park where there's a distillery in Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. right? Like at, at Whitmire's. And that you can, can just go full on country bumpkin and go to the hill country and <laughs> yeah I, I mean, seriously you yeah know, I, I mean it's it's kind of crazy it's the like amount the, of difference if you got a garrison brothers it's like the uh the, the gift shop is basically a log cabin yes right? it is and then and then you go up to you know iron root and mm -hmm. it's a former car dealership i believe it's a, it's a former boat dealership boat dealership yeah. yeah and um and so it's just completely different experiences but you get to see the passion of the people yeah, and so, that's, what, that's what you really experience when you go there. So one of the things that I've been wondering is if you weren't super involved in the whiskey groups, yeah. what on earth made you want to start the Texas Whiskey Association? Um, so that's a great question. Um, I, I Basically, I, I've worked my entire career in public affairs communication. So basically, anything where there's kind of an advocacy issue or public affairs issue, um, in, in a particular industry. So, so think politics, but not for candidates or parties, but, but issues, mm -hmm. right? I've always kind of worked in that space. And um, I saw this Texas whiskey industry emerging, and it seemed to me like if they're one, – one, I'm just kind of a whiskey geek. I, when I was in college, I, I bartended and had to take some classes on scotch as part of my training as a bartender and just kind of fell in love with the scotch whiskey industry – because of the variety and the differences sure. of flavors and things like that. So I just kind of became a whiskey geek. And then when I saw Texas doing something, I'm like, well, that's great. I, I, I would love to see this thing take off as a fan. Of right. It, right. But I did see the, the cool and the, the bad thing about Texas is that the, the brand of Texas is bigger than the brand of Texas whiskey. Okay. Right. So think, you know, when you go around the world and you show people the physical, the, the political boundaries of the of state the of Texas, state. you hold that up to somebody and you're like, what's that? They're like, that's Texas. Right. You show them the Lone Star flag and they're like, what's that? They're, that's Texas. Right. Um, there's a mythology that goes along with it. And as a marketing and advertising professional and somebody that does public affairs communications, I saw that this was something that people were going to use whether or not they actually made the product here. Mm. Right because it's an easy branding opportunity. Kind and of what Diageo did with Tin Cup and um, what was the Templeton Rye. There's a lot of examples, There's, right? right yeah. of, of how, do we, how do we market a whiskey quickly with and, something that creates a mental association with people and whiskey? And the old cowboy movie, swinging into the, you know, the, right, the, saloon the saloon and asking for a shot of whiskey, like that seems like a very Texas thing. But ironically, there hasn't been whiskey distillation in Texas until about 12 years ago. Right. Right. So. Tito's. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, Tito, Tito's definitely like opened the door to distil distilling after prohibition in Texas. And then Garrison and Balcone has kind of kicked that door down with whiskey. With whiskey, yeah. Right. So like it's a new thing, but it seems like it's an old thing. So right. established, uh, you know, sourced whiskeys could come in from out of state and say that put Texas all over the label and that doesn't help the industry actually happen in the state. It helps that company make money. It helps that, that company make money, right. but that doesn't help employ Texans and right. that doesn't help um, the Texas economy grow. Mm -hmm. And if anything, we're proud about our state, right? Sure. I mean, uh, for example, Dairy Queen has its own advertising campaign for Texas, is Texas than it does for the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. You know, Ford trucks have Texas editions and all the trucks have a Texas edition. Right, right. Right. So like everybody's trying to capitalize on our own pride. And it's like, well, what if we actually took pride in our, in, in what the whiskey was right. and at least set some kind of a ground rule of what defines a Texas whiskey. And that's where 
the certified Texas whiskey seal and idea came up, came from. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And so that is the most entrepreneurial shit I think I've ever heard. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like this is how things get created people, right? Because yeah. what happens is there's somebody that has this idea and then they do research and they're like, Oh wait, like there's no one stopping me from doing this. Like yeah. I don't have to get government permission. Right. Right. I can just do it. And then you just do it. And then it's a thing and everyone assumes. And what's more Texan than that? Right. Exactly. Right? So everyone just assumes that like, Oh, he had to go to the legislature and he had to, you know, get them to pass some sort of a bill and blah, blah, blah. And really all it was is that you had to form a nonprofit organization yep. and do a little bit of research and then boom, as long as, as long as everybody agrees that you are the Texas Whiskey Association, you are the Texas Whiskey Association. That's right. Right. And, and that's what the, that was the hard part, right. right? The hard part was getting everybody to agree on those basic common principles. Sure. Right. Yeah. Like herding cats. Yeah. And in, in the article I say, it's like herding alpha dogs because that's right. That's what no, it is. No one starts a spirits production company in the United States or in Texas unless they're alpha. No, right? absolutely not. Because it's, it's an uphill battle from beginning to end. To be honest, if you're a producer and you're listening to this, I respect your gangster, sir, but you are insane. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, or ma'am. Uh, there are yeah, some yeah, female producers out there as well. So no, it's a lot. not leaving any, anyone out. And so we as consumers, we don't understand that. Right? Yeah. We, we just walk into the liquor store. There's stuff on the shelf, yeah. right? There might be somebody pouring out samples or whatever, and that's all that we see. Yes. And so, but that doesn't really create understanding or brand loyalty or brand understanding. So is that what the Texas Whiskey Association is trying to fix? I think we're trying to fix a couple things. One, I think we're trying to educate the consumers about what a Texas whiskey is and what it is not, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we always focus on what it is first. Because, you, you know, you said it, this is some entrepreneurial activities that all of these people are taking part in. And, you know, whether you're Dan Garrison or Jared Hempstead or Chip Tate or Joanna Salinas or, or you know, even you know, Heather Green coming to Texas, you know, from New York. Like, these are all people that see an opportunity and want to come down here and do something cool and, and unique. And I think that that's an important thing that should be respected. Right. And that's why we call our, our top tier of membership trailblazers because that's what these other producers are. Work, they're, right. they're, yeah. They just came out here and said, well, what can we do? What can I spend right. five to $30 million on that's likely not to work that I'm passionate about. Right. Like, right. <laughs> right. No, for, for real. And, and if you look at the Scottish whiskey tradition, that was the same thing there. There's a lot of parallels between Scotland and Texas. Uh -huh. So, I mean, you know, we both have extreme amount of pride in our, in our country. Mm -hmm. You know, Texas was a country folks. It was. Yeah. You know, we have, we have a ex extreme amount of pride in our country. We had a revolutionary battle, including, you know, like people Fighting who, for our freedom. Who, yeah. who fought for their freedom. Um, you know, you got William Barrett Travis, you got, you know, William Wallace, you got these, these kind of, you know, iconic figures in the history of each of these places. And one of the big things in Scotland was the, the tradition of, illicit distilling mm -hmm. because they didn't want to pay the taxes that they were being forced that were being forced upon them on barley or, or other things. And, and illicit distilling was, was a big part of their culture. And then it took, you know, Glenn Libet to kind of come forward and say, Hey, we're going to go legit follow the laws that actually created the industry. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think a lot of us saw is that there, are, there were people who were not following the rules, mm -hmm. people who are not following the laws. Um, the people who were supposed to be enforcing the laws weren't necessarily enforcing the laws. So it was Wild West in that regard. So what could we do? Well, we set our own standard. Right. And we agreed on our own standard without, without taking it to, to law. Now, at some point, it may become law, but at the very least, we can set a standard that says just do the things that are part of whiskey production here in the state. Sure. Employ people, make sure it works, and then you can create a an industry around that. Right. So follow the laws and then do what you're doing do what you're doing here in the state. Right. And that creates a category. Right, sure. So, you know, basically there was a time not long ago yeah. where somebody actually spirits production companies have known for a long time that having 
the name of a locale on yes. a brand influences the local consumers. Yes. And there's famous examples of people lying on purpose to try and generate interest. For sure. And there were people that were doing that in the state of Texas. Yeah. They were, they were putting the word Texas on their label and there was nothing about the product that was Texas. Mm -hmm. It wasn't made in Texas. It wasn't bottled in Texas. Nothing about it was Texas. And you, and I'm sure other people who helped you saw that and said, not on my watch. And decided we are going to start an organization that causes the people who are doing it and doing it right to coalesce together yes. and to form kind of a, a, a super group, if you will. Mm -hmm. We're going to collect, we're going to pool our resources and yeah. we're going to use those resources to fight these problems mm -hmm. and create a standard so that when people see this information on a label, they know that they can trust what they're getting. Is that fair to say? I think that's that's very fair to say. Um, I, I I hesitate a little bit to say that we're just fighting against the 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 negative side of it because it is a lot. There is a lot of promoting the positive side because okay. that's a story that needs to be told. Is the the entrepreneurial thing that you're just referring to, right? Mm -hmm. That these you know these men and women who have decided to come out here and try to create this industry. They're crazy to do it. Right, you said it. I mean, it, it's it doesn't make sense, right? So when you're trying that hard at something, you need to have that story told somehow. And there, it, whiskey more than anything. I mean, you know, maybe with the exception of like, like Pacific fishing versus Atlantic fishing. Like whiskey is so specific to a region. Sure. And just I mean, wine is the same way. You know, tequila has laws around it. Um, you know, Bordeaux has laws around it. I mean, every, everything has this provenance to it, but Texas whiskey, for whatever reason, wasn't allowed to just be its own category. And I do think, and I think a lot of all of our members obviously think that Texas whiskey is so unique and so specific to the state that we needed to protect what the two words of Texas whiskey mean. So currently, is there a law in the books that prevents somebody from putting the word, the words Texas whiskey on a bottle if, the, if, the, if there's nothing about the product that's Texas? No. no. I mean, well, not at the state level. There, is a federal, there are federal labeling rules with the TTB that say that no, no label can deceive the consumer towards the state of distillation. If, de if determined by an appropriate officer of the TTB. So, you know, but how enforced that is, I mean, that, that rule is on the books. So if, if, you, if you put something out there that says that, you know, has the name of a region on it and it wasn't distilled in that region, then you're supposed to clarify it with where it was distilled. No, that, that often doesn't happen. And uh, look they, how politically correct he's being. <laughs> it, it doesn't happen almost all the time. If you want to go have fun, just go to your local liquor store and pick up bottles and check to see if you figure out, out what state it was distilled in. Yeah, you have to do a lot of research. You got to do a lot of research and it's supposed to just say it, right? Yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, that's, it, I, and I think based on what you're telling me is that they could say this is Texas ABC whiskey. Mm -hmm. on the front label and in tiny print on the back, they could say, you know, state of distillation, Indiana. Yeah. I, I've seen examples where, uh, you know, that the, the state of distillation was written on the label that gets torn off the cap when you, when, as soon as you open it. Right. You know, just to be technically compliant. And, um, that's look, I, I mean, I, legal. Yes, I guess. But is, is it, it right? The, is it right? right. And, and that's why we're, you know, with the certified Texas whiskey mark, we're trying not to take necessarily a legal approach to it, but we're trying to take a industry standard approach to it. Right. To say like, no, 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 we're going to have a higher standard. We're going to have the highest possible interpretation of the TTB rules. We're following the law and we're not creating new rules. We're just taking the highest possible interpretation so that, so that the, the, our members and the, the products that are certified are unimpeachable in right. the eyes of the federal government. Right. Well, and, that's how it starts, yes. right? Is, is an industry, you can come together, you can agree on standards, you can follow those standards, you can create your own, what is effectively at the time just marketing, yes. right? Because this sticker is really just marketing 
But as a consumer, you know what that sticker means yes. once you've been educated. That's right. Right? And so, but there might come a time in the future where the whiskey industry in Texas becomes big enough that legislators believe that it needs to be protected as an industry right. and they may start to adopt some of the principles of the Texas Whiskey Association into the laws. We, we would welcome that discussion. Of sure. Course. sure. Um, I mean, you know, look at Tennessee whiskey, right? Mm -hmm. Tennessee whiskey has been a branding effort for years and years and years before it actually became law in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I think in 2010, I think that's, that's roughly around the time that it was the, the, the Lincoln County process, you know, you know, dripping over sugar maple charcoal as part of that process is, is the definition of Tennessee whiskey. And that's a state law that is not federally recognized. Right. Right. But when it's shipped internationally and when it's recognized internationally, it's Tennessee whiskey. Right. right? Exactly. So, well, uh, technically the federal labeling law, it's technically bourbon. <laughs> it is technically bourbon, yeah. but I, I don't think that you could be compliant you could get a label approved for sure. Yes. Um, you can get a label approved for anything. It doesn't matter. Almost, it, it almost doesn't matter how wrong the label is. There's tons of labels that get approved that are wrong, but I don't think that legally you're, you were allowed to have Tennessee whiskey on your label. If it's, if it's not actually made in Tennessee, but if it is made in Tennessee, it is regulated by those laws. Mm -hmm. There's also empire rye, mm -hmm. right? And that's a standard. And yeah. that's a standard that's been set by Missouri Bourbon, ind one. individuals that have come together and they've said, hey, this is what our standard's going to be. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered because when I have the problem that I say bourbon over and over again sure. instead of whiskey, and I kept saying the Texas Bourbon Trail, yeah. uh, and I wondered whether or not when you first started, was that your objective to make it a Texas Bourbon Trail? But then as you started to bring the members together. There were some people that they're like, well, we don't make bourbon. We make wheat whiskey or we mm -hmm. make single malt or we make whatever. And you decided to broaden that out. That's a great question. And we, uh, because it, those two things go hand in hand. You're talking about empire rye. You're talking about Missouri bourbon, or I was talking about Missouri bourbon, Tennessee whiskey. Those are all standards. Some of which are in law, some of which, you know, are like us. Now what we've done with certified Texas whiskey is we have not set a style. So bourbon is a subcategory of whiskey. Sure. Right? Uh, you know, there's class and type. And the class is whiskey, and then there's the type. And it can be right. malt whiskey, bourbon. it can be bourbon, it right. can be rye, whatever. So one of the, you know, I think there are so much variety and innovation happening in the state of Texas that you specifically don't want to limit it, limit it to a style of whiskey. You want to make it available for innovation. Mm -hmm. So by calling it the Texas Whiskey Association, everything that falls underneath that category, which there's tons of, can can apply. So is that your intention from the from moment the of mental conception? Yes. Okay. Because, because so for example, what what is the most popular category of whiskey in the world? Uh, in terms of case volume sales? Well, I, probably. It's, I'm just saying in, in you know kind of the the zeitgeist of the world. Uh, Scotch. The Scotch. highest case volume is Jack Daniels. Scotch right. is the number one recognized category. Yeah. Of whiskey. When people think Scotch is a thing that is different from whiskey, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I've done a lot of education on that. Yeah. Yeah. And people think that bourbon is different. You know, I mean, we, we just had, had lunch a, a little bit ago and the guy says, oh, well, here's our whiskeys. But if you want to see our bourbons, here's our bourbons. Right. <laughs> And it was the same list. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, but like, so there's a lot of education that needs to go around around what is whiskey. And that's something that's distilled from grain that has the characteristics of the grain that's not distilled at too high of a proof so that it becomes vodka so that you're getting the flavor of the grain and, you know, and, and aged in oak. Mm -hmm. Right. So whiskey has a process associated with it and there's scotch whiskey, bourbon whiskey, rye whiskey, everything. So the certified Texas whiskey says this is a category across the board and whether you're making a single malt or a rye or using a triticale or, or wheat whiskey or whatever, it still falls into that bourbon, category. Whatever. It's all, yeah. As long as mashing, fermentation, distillation, maturation, and bottling happen within the state, mm -hmm. it is certifiable. It okay, doesn't so have to be a style. So it's say that again. Mashing, mashing, fermentation, distillation, maturation, and bottling. Okay. And so, um, milling though is not 
required? Well, some people use grain and grain flake. So you, you have to start with grain or grain flake. Mm -hmm. um, whether you milled it yourself or not is irrelevant. And, and by the way, not all the grain has to originate from Texas to be a certified product. Right. Right. So like, you know, this right here was made with Golden Promise malted barley from Scotland. Right. But every step of the whiskey making process from grain to glass happened in the state. So when right. you think about all of the different decisions that have to get made in your manufacturing process yes, of where you source your grain from and is it GMO and do you use a hammer mill yes. or do you use the, what's the other kind that they use in Scotland? Roller mill. Yeah. Roller mill. Do you use a, do you use enzymes? Do you use enzyme packages. Right. Or do you use malt of barley? Yeah. Do you, you know, what type of barrels, what size, are they toasted, are they, uh, what level of char, and all of these different things. Yes. How did you come up with your list of what was important for Texas? Was it about getting the producers together and going, what's common among all of you that we can all agree on? That was part of it. Um, but I think the biggest thing was all of those things are general processes that have to happen in whiskey making, right? You have to create a mash. You have to ferment that mash. You have to then distill it. You have to mature it. And then you have to bottle it, mm -hmm. right? In Scotland, it can't be scotch unless it leaves the island in a bottle, right? If it leaves in a tote or a barrel, it's no longer scotch whiskey, okay. right? Um, it means it was bottled and it's a product of Scotland, right? So everything from grain until it hits the glass is a process. And as long as those processes are happening in the state, then it's a certified product. Mm -hmm. that it happened in Texas. If you are working together with another distillery down the road and you're like, Hey, I want to take some of your distillate and I want to age it here. And I want to, you know, we're, that's still in the state. Sure. Right. And what, what that does, uh, the reason why that standard is important is because that employs people, mm -hmm. right? Right. That creates an industry that puts people's roots down here in the state and that creates an industry. Otherwise you're just shipping things in and out of right. the state. Right or letting consumers buy things with the name of Texas on it, but you're not creating an industry. So those are the, those, those five common steps of the whiskey making process are the things that everybody has to do in order to create a whiskey. Right. And we just ask if it wants to be a certified Texas whiskey that you do it. In the, state. Things. the only one that I was um, a little thrown off by is bottling mm -hmm. because bottling operations can kind of be an expensive investment for a distillery mm -hmm. and it is possible to contract that out. Yeah, sure. Right. I'm a little surprised that that's part of the certification for a Texas whiskey. I'll tell you why, because when we're certifying things, we're certifying them as a SKU, an individual product number. Uh huh. Right. So that you know that this, this product SKU is certified or this product SKU is certified. When it, when it, if it leaves the state in a, in a tote or something else and it could be cut and added with other things, then all of a sudden you can't verify any longer that that was a certified Texas whiskey. Mm -hmm. Right. But when it's, when it's bottled, then that's bottled under a SKU number. Mm -hmm. And then, and then that's what we ask our members to submit to us is submit the SKU number and the COLA number, your approved label along with the request to make this certified. And then annually we, we make sure that that's that the processes going into those SKUs are actually being certified. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So similar to the concept behind the bottle and bond act, you know, similar. we're going to do all of it here at the distillery under the watchful eye. And now the consumer knows that what they're getting is legitimate. Yeah. Right. So I, I get that. Yeah. If, if you as a consumer don't know this, there's actually a lot of, you're kind of on the honor system oh, yeah. in a producer world, right? Because you have to sign a affidavit under penalty of perjury that you followed all the rules. Yeah. But the government doesn't have enough, Not enough resources. resources to actually go and verify that these people are doing it. Yeah. And that's created some of the most major, you know, public hubbubs about smaller producers or whether or not they're adulterating the whiskey and all that stuff because Really, when you submit your information to, you know, for your label approval mm -hmm. or whatever, um, the TTB, they're just like, hey, did you do all the stuff that we told you to? And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. I got it, bro. Right. And then there are other people that may taste the whiskey and go, ah, no, I think this has been adulterated. Yeah. But 
I've not heard anything like that about anyone associated with the Texas Whiskey Trail, and I've visited many of these places. And when yeah. you when you visit the places, and, let, and let's actually talk about that. Oh, yeah, you're first. out. You're out of oh, whiskey. Oh. Yeah. So let's move on, move to, on the to Iron Root. Iron Root. Sorry, I've been talking too much, folks. Yeah. So it's it's my trick that I use. Mm -hmm. I I make my guests talk the whole time, and then I and get, you to, get just, to drink the whole. I just get to drink whiskey, and it works. Oh, this is going to be interesting because I had like probably a very very little bit of lone elm left before pouring the harbinger in so uh, i be, did i did what i call you liked you liked my my a little evolution barrel my phrase uh uh wiper -roo. yeah i use the word rinse <laughs> right and so so if i'm at a tasting and somebody's like oh try this i'll grab i always grab the bottle because they're they'll pour into my dirty glass yeah sure and i don't and i don't want that yeah, yeah. and so i'm i'm like very gently just splash a little bit in there and they're like yeah. what are you doing i'm like it's a rinse a -roo. <laughs> you gotta do a little rinse -roo. yeah like we also have, it's appropriate we all, all have three north texas trail yes and and it's because it's easy for me to get them up here yeah although right. i am i am headed down south i'm coming down your way okay. and uh gonna be interviewing ty next month great and uh, so pretty excited about that. And then I'm going to, I'm going to make it to the South Texas region. Nice. And uh, so there's, there's actually very exciting stuff in the future of certified Texas whiskey. Yes. We've got Gulf Coast, Gulf Coast distillers. Yes. They're about to fire up a still that's enormous. They're already producing a ton. Okay. Um, you know, with the F3, what they call their Frank, you know, Frank stills or kind of like Frankenstein, Frankenstein, copper, Stein. Copper inlay, They're hybrid, yeah, hybrid, hybrid stills that are pot stills that they have. Um, then they have some columns that they'll they're they're pretty impressive. So their their production is going to be going up. Um, ultimately, that's a good thing um, because we're going to have certifiable certified. Texas whiskey that can be purchased. Yes, by what's effectively a, a non distiller producer that wants to operate in the state and build their brand because that's one of the problems that we have in the state of Texas is that the cost of opening up a distillery is astronomical. It's and if you, if you want to hear the details about it, you can go watch my podcast with the Gala Days. You can watch The Truth About Texas Whiskey, especially yeah. the podcast with the Gala Days, because we get into some details. And distilleries are required to rent their facility or buy their facility, set all their equipment up, apply for their producer's license, and then find out whether or not they're going to be allowed to right. ever use the equipment. That's a lot of money to expend. And then if anything is wrong, if something goes wrong, like at Iron Root, somebody hit a tank with a with a forklift and they couldn't get another one produced, it slowed them down by a whole year. Imagine investing all this capital and thinking that you're going to start making money on a certain date, and you find out, oh, that's delayed by 12 months. Right. Right. So just all of a sudden, hey, your next 12 months worth of income is just gone. Yeah. And so, and then if you're at a city, by the way, if you're if you're trying to build your distillery inside a city forget limit, forget about city, then then you have another like a major city downtown area. Then you have a the whole other set of fire and all, codes. Yeah, it's, and, it's nuts. So yeah. uh, still lost in respect, you guys for going through that. Oh my that. gosh, yes. Um, and so there's there's all these barriers to entry, but it would be nice if there was a Texas production company that was willing to do uh, non-distiller produced whiskeys, willing to do contract distilled whiskeys so that producers could build their brands yes. and still be a true Texas whiskey before they actually invest that capital and know that they already have an existing customer base. Look, it, it, that's one of the things that I think was an early myth about our organization is that we were just anti-sourcing and that's not the case at all, mm -hmm. right? So two things. One, to be a member, you have to have have to be producing at least one certified product, mm -hmm. and then every other product, whether it's sourced from out of state or not, has to be labeled to the highest transparency levels of the TTB code. Okay. Period. Those two rules are are very very important. Just mm -hmm. make one in the state, have it and release it under your DSP and or at or for sale at the distillery, and then. Be honest about everything else. Sure, right, right. And you showed me a bottle, which we're not going to talk about. Yeah, you show me a bottle, somebody that's thinking about joining, and you show me the back label, and it was a hundred percent transparency. Transparent. They said exactly where all the whiskeys came from, what the percentages was, where what the mash bill was. Yep, all of that, and, and more information is always better than less. That's what consumers deserve. And so, even if you're not a Texas whiskey fan. If you're a whiskey fan, you should care about transparency. Yes. And this organization is helping to push transparent transparency forward 
inside the state of Texas. Yeah. Think about nu think about nutrition facts on the back of every food product you buy. Mm -hmm. Like how disclosed they have to be as to exactly what, how much niacin you have in there and your riboflavin and like like every additive that's that's a part of the compounds of whatever you're you're getting in that package. Those are all laws, right? Mm -hmm. That's the FDA, right? But for some strange reason, when it comes to this this highly regulated alcoholic product we are just kind of like, yeah, 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 whatever. It's just whiskey. It's just whiskey. It's right. like, no, this is a recipe that has things in it that, you know, consumers, consumers should, know. should know, right. They should know where, what they're, what they're putting in their body, especially when it's something that has an intoxicating effect. It's, it's an important thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, this is something that needs to be treated with respect, mm -hmm. right? It's not something that you should just slam down. And, when you're trying to appreciate it, then you should know what you're appreciating at sure. the very least. Right. So more information, like our, our goal is more information is always better than less. And that applies to whether it's a certified product, a certified Texas whiskey, or whether it's a, another whiskey product. And that's kind of where we stop. We don't, we don't get into the clear spirits. We just kind of focus on the whiskey side of things. And, and you can be a member and produce just one product and source the rest. And some of those sourcing and blending operations are pretty impressive and fun. Mm -hmm. And I think some great whiskeys being made by Texans here that maybe didn't originate in the state. But it's also important for us to have small producers and big producers, like you're talking about with Gulf Coast, because you can't have an industry if it's only one, one thing, little level. Yeah. Like if it's only if it's all the big guys and none of the craft or small. And I, I always I hate, that I, word, I hate yeah. the word craft because it shouldn't mean small. Right, because there are some large producers that produce amazing craft whiskey, and then there's some small producers that produce amazing craft whiskey, and there's some small producers in this world that don't produce good whiskey. <laughs> yeah, right? Sure. Like it, you can, it, can, it can be across the board, but the industry should be like from from small to large. They should all be included under the same under the same rules. Again, to go back to that NFL analogy, there's always going to be a a, a seller dweller you know, in the league. And then there's going to be that team that everybody hates that wins every year, but you've got to have this, you've got to have a spectrum uh, right. in order for it to be an industry. Right. No, I agree. And for, com and for competition to flourish. Well, and, and that's what I can respect as a, as a, I'm a, I'm an advocate for whiskey consumers. Yes. Even though I don't, I didn't start a trade organization, uh, but I at least try to educate the public. About it's not a very big money making prospect, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it's it's losing money, folks. Uh, but but we're working on it. We're working. No, we're on working on it. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, I I try to educate people so that they understand and and whatnot, and I I just feel like it's it's needed, right? And, yeah. And people. There, there's going to be a shift, and I'm, I made the comment. I said you need to get on the right side of history here, because there's going to be a time where the Texas whiskey production is respected and it's understood worldwide. It's right. its own thing. Texas is developing its own sort of terroir. This is Randy Sullivan with the Randall Sullivan Home Selling Team and the host of Bourbon Real Talk. Producing a podcast is time-consuming and expensive. And Bourbon Real Talk wants to maintain its integrity by not promoting products and services that it doesn't believe in. For this reason, I've opted to have my real estate team sponsor this program. The Randall Sullivan Home Selling Team has operated since 2008. We've sold almost 500 homes. We have proprietary programs that make a massive difference to the outcome of our clients, and we service the entire North Texas area. If you live in North Texas and you need to buy or sell a home, please give us a chance to explain how our services could benefit you. We understand that not all of our listeners live in North Texas. We also know that not all real estate agents are created equal. If you need a real estate agent outside of North Texas, the Randall Sullivan Home Selling Team has access to tools to help you find a highly qualified agent in your area. The service is free for you, and we stick around through the end of the process to help you with your transaction, even when we're not your agent. If you have a real estate transaction in your future, please reach out to us at randallsullivanteam.com, Facebook, Instagram, or just give us a call at 214-385-9101.
which is a wine industry term. Sure it is. And, and a lot of people don't like the use of that word in whiskey. At yeah, all. and yeah, I don't give a shit if you like it <laughs> uh, because it, it it has a meaning that if you know what it is, you understand it, and that is that the wine tastes like the place. Yes, that there's more that affects the flavor of the wine. It's the it's the you know average as, uh, uh, the av average weather. It's the average temperature. It's the elevation. It's the soil type. It's the exactly. It's everything that melds together to make something that's unique that tastes like that place. And in Texas, we have a hotter climate. Yes. We have different grain varietals that grow here. There are a lot of factors that influence the flavor of our whiskey. That like make it different. five climate regions. We have five know. different climate zones. So, you know, I, I think that what's going to happen in the long run is people are going to realize that, Texas is its own sort of category. Yes. And it'll stop being judged in comparison to Scotch or to Japanese whiskey or to Kentucky whiskey. And it'll start being judged as a Texas whiskey. And how does that taste compared to other right. things? Right. I mean, so you, you know enough about Scotch to know, you know, the five regions of Scotland, right? Uh, yeah. I think it's uh space side highlands, lowlands, Isla, and I can never remember the last Campbelltown. One. Camp, yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, which is Campbelltown, <laughs> right? But like, um, those five regions can fit in a triangle that's basically College Station, West Austin to Dallas. Hmm. That's it, right? Think about how much more space we have, how in much Texas. more climatological regions we have. You now, um, I mean, everything changes when you start talking Texas whiskey. You start talking about age statements, right? A twenty-five-year-old hmm. Scotch is 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 an important thing because in 25 years, you're going to have 25 cycles of their weather right. going into those barrels. Right. And a lot of it's around 45 degrees. You know, I'm talking Fahrenheit here folks, but you know, 45 degrees to 60 degrees to 35, you know, it's kind of in that zone. Right. And it doesn't fluctuate too much. Uh, I don't know what it was here in Dallas yesterday, but in Austin, it was, you know, 90 degrees and today it's 59. Right. Right. And it'll be 85 in Austin, to, not tomorrow, but two days from now. Mm -hmm. So in the month of October, we're going to have what is effectively two annual cycles of temperature swings in Scotland, Scotland but, in, but yeah. in a month in right. Texas. Right. And that's going to push the, the, the distillate in and out of the wood. Um, things are going to change. You're not going to have as much time for oxidation. You, there's lots of things that are going to change. People like Iron Root are doing elevage techniques so that they can understand like how do we pull more wood sugars out to allow it to sit in the barrel longer? They're doing, they're figuring things out, but everything changes when you start talking about what the place is doing to that barrel. Sure. So let's talk about the iron root whiskey yeah. since we switched over. So I like to joke that iron root whiskey is the everything bagel of whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> right. I like that. And it makes you look like a whiskey expert because you can give this to somebody and you can say anything. Yeah. And as a tasting note, yeah. and it's in there. Cotton candy, sure. Blood orange, all day long. Mm -hmm. Vanilla, enough to kill your mother. Like, it's <laughs> just, there's so much in here. Yeah. I get a lot of caramel popcorn. Yeah. But this, on some of their other offerings, it's more prominent. This one is so spicy, and I really like spice. Yeah. And so this one is so spicy. When we went back to do our next barrel pick, I almost picked this sister barrel. But I, I, I lost the room, and, and really? they went with something that was a little bit softer and sweeter and not as spicy. Yeah. But uh, it's probably a good idea because I, I, I already had this one. Yeah. Um, so, so oh, this yeah. is, it's fantastic. And mm -hmm. uh, elevage is a technique that's mostly used in the uh, Armagnac and Cognac region of France. It's with brandy, and as you age spirits, you have what's angel share, and the and the barrel starts to diminish in its volume. Mm -hmm. And in the state of Texas, especially, our proofs will spike. Yes, because we're losing a lot of water from evaporation. Alcohol tends to evaporate with time. Water tends to evaporate with heat. We have lots of heat, so we lose water faster than alcohol, mm -hmm. and our our proofs go up in the barrel way far beyond what they need to. Right. So if you're going to proof a product down to something that's reasonable to drink, you're going to be adding, you know, distilled water that adds no flavor whatsoever at the end. All it does is just cut it down. 
but that water never interacted with the barrel, right? Because you're putting it in at the end. Elevage technique is where you add water throughout the process as your barrel uh, fill level goes down from evaporation, you put water back in. And there are some compounds that are in barrels that are extracted better by alcohol yes. and some that are extracted better by water. Yeah. And so part of the reason I believe that the, the licorice family's whiskeys are so full flavored is that they're getting the best of both worlds by using that. Yeah. And, and they're also, you know, experimenting with larger size barrels and, and trying to, to buy time. Right. Um, now, now, interestingly, uh, in the Gulf Coast region, most of their barrels proof down over time. They have higher humidity. Because they have a lot of high pressure, high humidity from the Gulf region, from mm -hmm. the Gulf of Mexico. So, Is it salty? Can you taste salt in the whiskey? Because um, I taste I've, a little... I've had a few that, that taste that way. I, I, you know, I, I don't know if you're getting it from the air as much, but or, or you know, like, like you do in a Lafroig or something like that. But uh, like even that, that's hard to say if they're getting it from the maturation zone or if they're getting it from the soil, from the peat. But... but you know, you do, they do proof down mm -hmm. in, in the Gulf Coast region. So it is a different product mm -hmm. than it is in other parts of Texas where it's proofing up, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a natural elevage technique in a way. Right. Um, so like that, that is why um, on the trail, we, the, the trail has three regions, North Texas, Hill Country, and Gulf Coast. Uh, we'll add more as we add enough distilleries per region. But the regions aren't just defined by groupings mm -hmm. of close together distilleries. They're defined by regionality of the, of the zone, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so that the whiskeys have a similar climate. So if you're going to go. Yeah, so yeah, you can compare gotcha. a hill country to a North Texas and say, hey, this is, you know, in the hill country, the, the reason why I think there's so many distilleries in the hill country is because it's this weird, unique zone where it's where the cold fronts stall out, right? Like the cold fronts come through North Texas they make their way past Waco into central Texas. And then very rarely do they make their way all the way to, to south Texas and the coast. They kind of, and then, you know, you get this pushback from the Gulf moisture. So Austin kind of has this back and forth zone where it's like hot and humid, cold and dry, hot and humid, cold and dry, depending on, on the season. Of course, it's hot in the summer like it is everywhere. But that creates this unique aging environment where you're having a lot of Gulf moisture and dry Rocky Mountain cold front air coming down, right? right. Um, and then in the Gulf Coast, you're having a high humidity environment. Um, I think there's probably other regions like the High Plains region. If the, if if somebody wants to, you know, be stupid like we're saying, <laughs> make, go out and make it build a distillery up in uh, Lubbock or Amarillo, because I think that I think that there's some interesting things that could happen there. Sure. You know, a lot of our grain producers are up there. We have uh, uh, Maverick Malt House, which is an allied trade member of ours that's producing barley and malted barley up there. Uh, MBS Seed here in Denton, Tex Malt in Fort Worth. Like they're all drawing grains from the hill or from the High Plains region. In fact, uh, Balcones released a High Plains single malt. I have it. It's and it, it couldn't be more different than than the Golden Promise malt. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's terroir. Yeah. Whether or not you like that word that you are tasting Texas land, Texas soil, Texas barley. And then it's the exact same process with everything except for the base grain. And it took four years to get the grain to do that. Yeah. Because they had some rain issues. They had some crops fail. It's hard to make whiskey in Texas. It's well, really hard. And, 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 and barley is hard to grow in Texas because it prefers colder weather. And there haven't always been malt houses in Texas too. So right. that's kind of a newer thing. And barley can grow up in, in the panhandle. It can. Yeah. You know? And so we're, but it hasn't been a cash crop because there hasn't been an industry for it. Sure. Sure. It has helped with brewing and everything. But when they started trying, they, yeah. they had some failed crops, of course. you know, so that's, that's nuts. Um, so let's talk about the purpose of the trail mm -hmm. from, from the, perspective of the producer sure and then we'll switch and we'll talk about it from the perspective of the consumer yeah so from the producer side um there's a lot of whiskey being produced in america right now um kentucky indiana oh thank you sir uh a lot of whiskey being produced and Yes, we are in a whiskey boom right now, 100%. If you saw the Texas Whiskey Month or Texas Monthly article, that's the title of the article: is the whiskey boom. The Can great, you tell people where to find that? 
Uh, yeah, go, I mean, you go to texasmonthly.com, of course. You can also go to any of your uh, local newsstands or grocery stores or any pl place like that and just check it out. It's the November issue. Um, and all of our members and the growth of the Texas whiskey industry is being featured in, in this month's issue. So gotcha. you'll, you'll learn a lot, a lot about the history over the past 10 years. Um, but we're in a whiskey boom right now, and people are interested in the product, and that's a great thing. At some point, there may be too much whiskey in the world, <laughs> right, compared to people who want to drink it. But it's the brands that are going to have a relationship with their consumers. Mm -hmm. People who want to come and see the people who make it, understand the process of how it's being made, that will allow that, this industry to succeed, mm -hmm. right? So at the end of the day, that's why the Texas Whiskey Trail exists, is because we want to bridge that gap that has existed between the consumer and the producer. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's actual legal structures that, that help that gap be there. Mm -hmm. And then there's just kind of momentum and history that sure. has helped that, that gap be there. It's just, oh, it's just a thing I pick up at the store. But as you saw with the wine industry in California and other places, like when you go to a winery, when you go to a distillery, when you go and meet the brewer and you find out the story of it, you're building a relationship that's going to last way longer than any boom or bust is going to be. Right. 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 So that is the producer side goal of the trail. Well, and I can say that whiskey is a sensory experience. Yes. That is affected by literally everything in your life. Yes. Right? Couldn't be more. True. What did you have for lunch? Did you have a good day at work? Have you fought with your wife? Like everything affects your, your, your perception of whiskey. And I have personally observed multiple times where somebody said, I do not like this product. I'm not a fan of it. I was one of them. Mm -hmm. The first time I got asked, when I got asked to pick this barrel, I told the retailer, I said, I need to let you know, I don't drink Texas whiskey. And so I will go Yeah, and I will use all of my palate powers and I will pick the best whiskey they put in front of us. Right. But I'm not certain that this is a whiskey that I can full throated endorse because I don't drink Texas whiskey. Yeah. I took other people with me on that tasting. But when you go out and you see what these people have done, the sacrifice that they've made, the passion, the the tests that they had to run. Like if you're curious at all, go check out my piece, The Truth About Texas Whiskey, and you'll understand. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about imagine that you've never moved out of your parents' house. And you're an 18 year old kid and somebody plucks you out and puts you at the helm of a giant, you know, ship in the middle of the ocean. And then there's a storm going on and you've never navigated a boat before. Right. That's what it's like being a distiller in Texas. Yeah. No one was able to come along and tell, you know, Jared or, or, or Donis or, you know, whoever, mm -hmm. like, this is how you do it right. Yeah. There were, there was no playbook. Right. No one knew. And so when you go and you meet those people and you see that passion and you, and you, it, it honestly, it makes the whiskey taste good and people really enjoy these experiences, even if it's not a big fancy place, right? Like Balcones has an enormous, you know, facility and it's beautiful and it's in the city, but I've been to little bitty places and had just as much fun. Because when you're walking through and you're talking with these people that are literally sacrificed their entire lives to produce right. what it is that you're tasting in that glass, I mean, it really makes you appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but like the, the you're, you're right entirely that it's a sensory experience on all levels, mm -hmm. right? But it's, it's even more than that. It's, um, it's art, science, everything combined. Right. And, you know, all you have to know on, on a, like a purely scientific level is like have a glass of orange juice after you brush your teeth and you know that it doesn't taste the same right, sure. as orange juice in another setting. Right. right like, right. or after you've had a, have you had a slice of bacon, orange juice may taste great because you're getting contrasting flavors. So that's part science. It's part neurochemistry. It's, you know, but, you know, tell me what blue is to you and I'll tell you what blue is to me. We may agree that that's a common color of blue, but I don't know if that's actually what you're seeing or if that's what I'm seeing, right? Right. So it's entirely subjective at the end of the day. But what is 
objective is how difficult it is to make these products and the people who are working on it and the passion that they put into it. You can just see that. That is an objective fact. You walk into those places and you're like, my gosh, these people are working hard. Right. Right. And it, whether or not you, you enjoy that product, you're going to respect the process of making that product. Right. And have a good time. Right. So from a producer's perspective, this is the, the, one of the goals of the trail is to bring potential customers to your facility to create a, an experience that's likely to produce the result that you want with that customer. To create a connection. Right, because I've walked through a uh, hundred liquor stores where they had hired the sample bimbo. No offense to any sample bimbos out there, but you're walking by and she doesn't know shit about the product. She doesn't have any passion. She's like, do you want to try this? Right. right. And you try it and there's, there's nothing to draw you to it. There's no information. There's no connection. And it's so simple oh. to just go, eh. Yeah. Right. But when you're there and you have everything coming together, before you taste that whiskey, I feel like it produces a better experience. So that's part of the goal of the trail for producers. One hundred percent. I mean, it, it's it's to make it's to make producers have a like I said, bridge that gap between the consumer and the producer, mm -hmm. so that they understand who each other are. Mm -hmm. That helps producers also see what their customers want. Sure. Right. Because I mean, uh, Jer Jared talked about this at our our uh, Trailblazer event, which was an amazing experience, and I could talk about that if you'd like. But like, he's an expert. He's a, he's a sensory expert. Yeah. Like there's no doubt that he knows exactly what he's talking about more than I could ever even understand. Right? You know, that's one of my lowest uh, watched podcasts. Oh, really? And I'm like, you people are low key dumb. Like <laughs> this dude is, and the greatest thing about Jared and uh, Jared, if you're watching this, I mean this in the greatest respect. So honestly, Jared, I envy your look a little bit, but if you saw Jared, yeah. The first thing that pops into your mind is not chemical engineering genius. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like right. he's got this long beard, he's got, you know, long hair, gauged out ears. But when you talk to him, yeah. you know you were in the presence of greatness, right? Absolute top of his game. Top of his game and, and an absolute pioneer for Texas whiskey. Yeah. And so, you know, that's an experience that you get. Uh, when you participate as a trail member and go out to these locations. So let's talk a little bit about what you get as a consumer. Yes, sir. If you become a trail member and what they can expect. Yeah, so so there's three tiers of membership in the Texas Whiskey Trail. And uh, again, shout out to Kentucky, uh, people like Peggy No Stevens, who've done an amazing job of creating the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Um, it is a model that we're, we're following, but we're trying to do something that's specific to our state. So we mm -hmm. can't follow it exactly, and we, nor should we. Um, so, so at the base level, you can become a free rider. That means just sign up, register yourself, and then go and check in with your email address or your phone number at every distillery you visit and you'll earn points. Mm -hmm. At those points, you can get shirts, swag. You get a shirt. If you complete, if you complete the trail, we'll send you a shirt for free, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, no cost to you. Just, you know, start visiting places and, and check in. Then there's the Maverick level which right now is $55. It'll probably go up as we add more members to the trail. But $55 gets you free tours everywhere. Mm -hmm. Every, every distill, and it's an annual membership, so you have a year to go during your membership and go visit places and check them out, right? Go get a free tour. Then if you're a trailblazer, not only do you get the free tour, but we're going to send you a glass, a shirt, and a membership card. And that's going to give you exclusive opportunities throughout the trail. So... Uh, oh, you got, you got your card. I'm right going to get my card out. Look at this card carrying member. Card carrying member. Yep. Right there, people. Look at that. Look at that. It's beautiful. Um, so yeah, the, the, the card and the trailblazer level of membership gets you access to discounts at distilleries for merchandise. Can't, we can't give you a discount on alcohol. That's illegal. It's illegal um, in Texas, you know, but, but what we can do is give you access to things and access to the distiller. So, so that's what you get as a trailblazer, which is our top tier membership. You get discounts on merchandise and things at distillers. You get free tours everywhere. And then you get these opportunities where once a month we're going to do an exclusive something. Mm -hmm. And once a quarter, we're going to do an exclusive selection of a bottling that will be only available at that distillery. Gotcha. So the first one was Garrison. Now this next one's going to be Balcones. And if you're a trailblazer, you're going to get to, to you're going to get to buy a bottle of the thing that the other trailblazers. Yeah. 
right? So that's, and it's only at the distillery. Again, get them to the distillery, get them to visit the place. And, and have, have that experience. Understand the experience. So. Well, we're about to wrap it up. I feel like we got to show some Balcony some love. Yeah, this is, so, a, this is amazing. So this is a uh, single barrel selection that I was uh, lucky enough to participate in. David Burgos hooked me up. He has a relationship with Plump Jacks okay. out of San Francisco. Yeah. And their spirits director, he's always interested in doing unique single barrels. So he flew out, knew David, said, hey, can you put together kind of a tasting team? And so I got to go down there and do a single barrel selection. This this whiskey is like, oh, I mean, tons of cinnamon. I mean, like if... Chocolate, coffee, um, raisin. I mean, it's damn near a rye. Yeah. In, in, in a lot of ways. And that's, it's a weird thing for a single malt. For a single malt. Uh, like it, it's, it almost, this is as close to like, if, if I had done this blind, I probably would have thought that this was their, their high plains, like their Texas high plains. Really? Single malt. Yeah. Cause it's so spicy. Cause it's got that spicy grassy, you right. know, but I mean, that just goes to show you, you know, whenever the, breath. the when you, you're looking at a single barrel, it's a completely different product than the other single barrel. Sure. And when, when you're looking at a blend of in distillery products, then that's a completely different product for sure. So for sure. it's, it's, it's ridiculously fascinating folks. I'm sorry <laughs> that we're geeking out over it. But it's what we do. If you're watching this, then you're a geek too. So yeah, that's ha -ha. right. Yeah. If you made it this far, I'm proud of you. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll leave it at that. So if you want more information about Bourbon Real Talk, you can find us at bourbonrealtalk.com. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. You can search us on YouTube, Bourbon Real Talk, and find us there. Yep. And unfortunately, all of those services and all of the podcast apps, like podcasts on the iPhone, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, all those guys, their algorithms of whether or not they're going to show this podcast to other people yeah. are heavily influenced by whether or not you subscribe and give a review. Yes. And so if you have any love for this podcast at all, I beg of you. I'm begging at this point. I don't think I've ever begged before. Beg. It's a new thing. I'm begging. I'm begging you to it, go and subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on your podcast player and leave a review so that we can get some more exposure and get this good information out into the hands of people that need to see it. We are all a slave of the algorithm. We are a slave of the algorithm, people. So unless you have anything else to add, we're going to wrap it up. Oh, cheers, brother. Thank cheers. you for the time. I appreciate it very, Absolutely. very much. And for any cheers of you, you that are out there, if you woke up this morning and you're unsure whether or not somebody loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll mm -hmm. see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk.